Welcome back. We are continuing the restoration of our 8-bit ASR33 teletype. In the previous episode, we fixed the paper tape punch. All we have left to do is to retransmit it with the paper tape reader and we should be all done. Okay, turning the reader now. Okay, so there's hope. Again, for the sake of explanation, the printing error is indicated, indicated figure one, so it's read correctly. Yay, for once something looks like it works correctly. Almost. The reading is intermittent. It starts and stops, as if the contact was not working quite right. But I soon found out why. So I think I have fixed the last uh, problem with the reader that was intermittent. I look at adjustments um, and the last page was just bend the contact. So that was that contact here that was not working all the time. And I think now it should work. See if it works. Oh, because this thing is tight. So it has this interesting design feature that there is a little spring over here. And then if you put that up, it will stop it. There you go. That's not a bug, it's a feature. Still, there is something odd. I have to hold the start button through the whole tape read. For the demo, I had to request the assistance of Carl's finger to push on it the whole time. He actually got quite sore at the end. Surely, that's not how this thing is meant to work. That sent me down another rat hole, as something as simple as the reader's start-stop control was way more complicated than I would have ever expected. So while I was trying to understand why my reader wasn't latching, uh, that led me to a whole bunch of discoveries about how the reader works and it's way more complicated than I thought it would be. So first of all, uh, what makes the reader advance is a big electromagnet, which is down here. It's powered by 170 volt uh, DC, so it's a fairly strong electromagnet. So the tape reader is a mechanically independent subsystem and is powered by the big magnet. Every impulse of the magnet advances the tape and makes a read. And what drives the magnet is actually at the other end of the machine. So first there is a power supply right here. On my machine it's in the machine itself. On other machines it's in an extra box uh, that's under the machine. And the contact to the relay is way over here. So let me demonstrate. So watch. I'm going to close the contact by just using my, my blade. So it's 170 volt DC, so I'll, hopefully I won't get electrocuted. The hell? So don't do this at home. You can hear it? And you can see over there how I am advancing the tape. So this is what advances the tape in normal usage. Now how do you get the thing activated when you don't poke it with your screwdriver? Well it's activated by another much smaller magnet over here. 
And this one will attract the armature and hop, give me my one read and then be a reset when the machine has finished sending the character. I'll do it by hand. Now, why is it done like that? It's done because you want to send the character and you want to pace it by the pace at which the machine can send the character. So it's near the distributor that will trigger the start. Then the machine will send a character and after it's done sending, this thing resets and it's ready for another character. If that is still down, it will just send the other character at the right time. So it will just be paced by the time it takes to send a character. So the big reader magnet is really controlled by the smaller distributor trip magnet, which should be continuously on as long as one wants to read the tape. So the whole problem I have is that this thing is not continuously triggered. Now things start to get a lot more complicated when I start to look at the conditions of what would trigger my little magnet now, which is called the distributor trip magnet. It's a little magnet that trips the contact that trips the big magnet. And I was thinking, well, it's just going to trip when I uh, push the start button. And it actually it turns out that for the manual reader, that's the case. But it turns out there's another branch here, which is the automatic reader. And that's what I have. So the, on the automatic reader, there's another thing here and there's a relay. So now we have three magnetic things. We have a relay that controls the distributor trip magnet that control the reader magnet. So on an automatic reader machine like mine, there is yet one additional control layer. The so-called TDC relay controls the trip magnet, which in turn triggers the big reader magnet. It turns out that we have an example of both machines. My machine, which has the automatic reader and Robert's machine, which has the manual reader. And today we have Robert's, we have Bob's, and we have uh, mine over there. And there's a difference in how the reader works. This one has three, three locking positions. One, two, three, that's on, that's off. I can't remember what that one is. That's the one without the relay. The one with the relay have a temporary up and to temporary down. And what happens is that this is an electrical impulse that will latch the relay and this is an electrical impulse that will unlatch the relay and it is electrically controlled. And of course that led me down to a chase to find out where that freaking relay is hidden. And it turns out it's hidden next to the power supply assembly. There's a power supply with a relay and there's a power supply without the relay. Uh, Robert just came in <laughs> because he likes that his stuff is working. And he, that, that this time he brought his power supply and you can see his has no relay. And here's the relay one and you can see it right here. Problem is, is that my relay is apparently not functioning properly. Which of course led me to try to figure out what triggers the darn relay on an automated machine. And this is this page and it says automatic reader logic ASR sets with automatic reader only, which is what I have. You see the relay with a little bit of uh, spike protection over here. And what triggers it is actually quite complicated. There's this branch and what triggers it is either this or that or that. So it's a kind of an N or combination. So in the end, the TDC relay is activated by a whole bunch of contacts. Some that trigger it, some that latch it, some that release it. In the tangled case of relay logic. So let, let's follow it first. Here we find the stop contact, the tape out contact that we had on the manual, so that's normal. But in order to start it, the easiest way is to go through the start contact. And actually I can demonstrate that fairly easily. So here we go. I try the start contact. And you can hear the relay click over here. I'll show it to you in a minute. So in, in my machine, the relay contact is completely buried. So it's way out there. I think I can show it to you. 
but this is what happened when I press the start button the relay actually clicks and this starts the reader the problem is that it should latch it should stay on and it does not in my machine so what should happen but does not work on my machine is that once you have started here and the relay is on this relay contact should close it's linked to this one and then this alternate path should be closed and maintain the relay close and since it wasn't happening i went and looked at all the contacts and this one was fine this one was closed and then i went into these and this is called dc3 function contact and enq function contact and it took me a long while to figure out where those were i'll show you where they are so once you know it's pretty obvious but i didn't know so now of course i'm shining light on it in the middle of the field so here are my extra contacts they are those three micro contacts actually those three contacts are activated by three function bars and this actually were some of the ones that were stuck at the beginning of the restoration so i had a good look at them so there's this one this one and this one and there is if you're a keen eye there is a number on each of them and you can figure out which combination activates them if you go into the hieroglyphics and the one i have installed on my machine for the first contact is a 570 so that's x on the second one is 571 that's x off and the third one is 572 which is w w r u where are you so to make it more difficult to crack the hieroglyphics and they of course gave the function a different name on the schematic and on the code bar drawings but since you are masters at ascii control characters you also know that x off x on are actually called dc1 and dc3 in ascii and that wru is actually enq so the three correspond exactly to what's on the schematic so why would you do that whole complicated rigmarole? it's in order to control the tape reader remotely see i can start it using the contact in front of the machine or stop it using that but i can also do it without touching the machine if i send it a dc1 one the the function bar will activate a contact and that will be this pass and i can start reading the tape and then it will latch assuming everything is working correctly and then to stop reading the tape i can send it either a dc3 or an enq so that should allow me to control the tape reader from a remote source if everything works which of course it doesn't so it took me a while but after i understood all this it's very easy to diagnose the problem here are my two contacts and that's the first one there you go that one's closed that's correct that's the uh, enq contact and this one it should beep but it's open that is the dc3 contact and there you go we found the fault dc3 should normally be closed if it's open it will break the relay latch path and the reader will stop which is exactly what's happening to me so let's take a closer look at that body and see if we can repair it okay i think i got it okay come here come on and it's this little guy oh i see why it's not it's not coming back up okay yeah it's okay little oh it's broken oh that's a problem oh no it was out of Ugh. okay it was out of position okay well i think it's repaired 
it had fallen down let me see if i can put it back where it was there you go it was like this and all it needs to be is pushed in okay i'll put a little bit of contact cleaner but i think that was my problem Let's see if i can burnish it a little bit close close and this one Oh, this one should be closed and it's not. Oh, because it needs to be pushed before it's closed. It's normally closed here. We don't care. And there you go. So this is what this one is uh, normally open. All right. So that should work again. Okay. So I have mounted the contacts back and with a little bit of luck now, we should hear the relay latch. Latch, unlatch, latch, unlatch. Okay, so that is promising. I should now be able to turn the machine on local. Put it. At the beginning of the tape and now I shouldn't have to hold the button anymore. Yeah. Stop. On. Off. So let's see if the remote works. And for that I have my trusty HPO here. Okay. So it's connected. And I have my little cheat sheet table here. By the way, this is an interesting old version of the ASCII table in Octal that clearly shows how the code was arranged to make it easy on mechanical and Octal machines. All the control key does is swap the main block of uppercase characters to control characters. So you can immediately see that DC1 is control Q, for example. And the start is DC1. And that is control Q. And stop should be either control S or control E. Okay. Control Q. Oh yeah. Control S. Stop. It works. Control Q. Control E. Stop. It works. Okay. That's now working according to what it should do. I've loaded tape and I'm going to read the tape so usually I would read a program but here I'm going to read some text control Q here we go coming right through and control F I stop it and when I want to read more I do control Q So that's the Exxon Exoft protocol implemented mechanically. <laughs> I think that's awesome. We're reading the tape. And the text comes out this direction. 